Hello, and, and welcome back to St. Mary's Parish's series on the Church's different traditions of spirituality and prayer. I am tremendously grateful to, to Father Wayne and to St. Mary's for the opportunity to share with you the riches of the Carmelite tradition. My name is, is Brother Emmanuel, and I am a member of the Discalce Carmelite Friars of the Eastern Province of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and uh, a lifelong parishioner of St. Mary's as well. Let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for gathering us today. We thank you for the great riches of your church and for the great saints and teachers who have, who have brought us the message of your gospel and how you call us to deeper communion with you. We ask you during this time to, to be more deeply aware of, of how you are calling us, each one of us to be aware of the great desires you have for us, the great plan you have for each of us, and how deeply you love us. O faithful virgin, when you uttered your fiat, the greatest of all mysteries was accomplished in you. In what peace and recollection did you live and act? Teach me to sanctify my most trivial actions and to spend myself for others when charity requires it, yet all the while to remain like you, the constant adorer of God within me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we begin to reflect on what are the core elements of the Carmelite tradition. And I think we can find no better example than in Our Lady, Our Mother Mary, at the encounter of the Annunciation. She is the one to whom all the great Carmelite saints, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and Therese of Lisieux, point to in order to teach us what it means to encounter God. In the Annunciation, Mary, uh, as the the spiritual ideal and mother of all Carmelites, shows us the truest example of, of what it means to encounter God and to respond to Him. These two moments are, are the atmosphere, the very atmosphere in which Carmelite spirituality frames each person's relationship with God. In order to be attentive to this, this very simple but immediate dynamic of prayer, Carmelite spirituality lays special emphasis on some degree of solitude, to be able to perceive what God is doing in us and to hear what he is saying to us. It's very, Carmelite spirituality is, we would have to say, is a, is a very contemplative spirituality. Um, and, and it is only when we take the time to be quiet, to, to at least try to be aware of God's presence in our day-to-day, -day, that we can hear him. This is what all Carmelite writers have, have reveled in, have rejoiced in, when they're writing to whomever, whatever they're writing, letters or treatises. Um, now, of course, not all of us are called to remove ourselves from the day-to-day -day business of the world, like uh, friars, hermits, or monks. Um, but Carmelite spirituality offers an answer for all Christians, regardless of the state of life, of how to grow in deeper communion with God. And this is what is called the cultivation of the interior room of the heart, the interior cell of the heart, much akin to what the Dominican Saint Catherine of Siena speaks of, where each person can grow in awareness, in deeper awareness of God's personal presence. One living Carmelite friar um, has spoken very beautifully on what the Carmelite, the great Carmelite saints, especially Therese and John, teach us about this solitude. It is more than we might be drawn to think of as simply of physically removing ourselves to a place alone. Um, Carmelites, the Carmelite tradition sees in this solitude the environment in which we can begin to divest ourselves of all that we hold between us and God. Um, and it is this, it is in this we find the commandment to take up our cross daily, as Jesus calls for so powerfully in the Gospels. Um, we are speaking more of a, of a spiritual or interior solitude, one in which we can begin to see how, how all else pales in comparison to God's will in our lives, whatever be the circumstances of our state of life. As we continue to be faithful to this practice, to this attitude of kenosis, this emptying of ourselves, of all that is not from God, as he wills for each of us, 
um, we open ourselves more deeply to the work of his love. We begin, as John of the Cross says, to be filled with the inflow of the love of God. This is very beautiful. Um, St. Therese and the Carmelite teachers offer their own experience for us to see how it is our desires that are the locus of, of God's action in our lives. When we begin to, to realize that, that what we desire for ourselves apart from God is nothing in comparison to what God in his generous love wants for us, then we are able to repeat with, with Our Lady her beautiful words of the visitation, her beautiful words of praise, the Almighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. The scriptures uh, reveal to us uh, that God is always the first mover. St. John the Evangelist in his first letter says, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son as expiation for our sins. We might say that every Carmelite or uh, one in whom we could see a Carmelite spirituality at work has sensed that God has moved him or her to be more aware of what he, what he got, what God is doing in that person's life, and how he is present and asking for a, a fuller gift of that person's self. This is unquestionably the case with Our Lady in the in the Annunciation. The Lord appeared to her in the presence of the angel, but um, and right away it was abundantly clear to her that this was God calling for a total undivided gift of self. Mary exemplifies for us those these indispensable dispositions that we are to strive for in our, in our relationship with God. These are um, humility, detachment, and, and a certain boldness born of love for God. These attitudes are numbered among the most, most important for Carmelites uh, in St. Teresa of Avila's book, The Way of Perfection, a work she wrote as a, as a manifesto of sorts for her nuns to live by but of immense importance for us still today, uh, seeking to be persons of prayer. St. Teresa reflects on these dispositions for the sake of describing what the Carmelite or, or any devotee can and must do to make himself available for God. That is this, uh, uh, the great effort that we are to strive for, is this availability. Um, and this is why Carmelite spirituality is so centrally Marian. In Our Lady, we find a perfect example of, of receptivity to God's loving presence and action. Um, in this way, Carmelite spirituality shows how remaining close to Mary uh, as often as we can is vital if we are to, to become persons keenly attuned to the Father's will. Now, um, an attempt to, to characterize Carmelite prayer in a, in a specific structured uh, way is is somewhat difficult because, because Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross both offered guidance for uh, their readers uh, for, uh, uh, to be able to have the greatest freedom in their relationship with God and how they were called to encounter God as he himself willed for them. Um, but, but if we were to offer, uh, if we were to recommend a, a practice or a prayer which they both wholeheartedly endorsed for, for all Christians, it would be what Teresa calls the prayer of recollection. Um, and this is something that we can both do ourselves and, and ways in which God can draw us more deeply. Um, she speaks of this in her book, the, Pr the Way of Perfection, chapters 26 through 28. Um, and she understands this prayer as a simple recalling or recollecting of one's thoughts and movements of the heart into God's presence. This, uh, in a sense, is it leads to and asks for a degree of interior solitude. Solitude, as we spoke about earlier, which is a, uh, an essential aspect of Carmelite spirituality. No matter where we are, uh, how busy we are, what, what we're doing, um, the faith that we have received in our baptism it allows us to embrace God in His presence wherever we are. Um, it is, of course, better if we can set aside some time in our day to be, to be, uh, to be attentive, to be quiet, uh, perhaps at the beginning, the middle, or end, depending on your preference. Um, uh, but, but with Teresa, um, the way she says, uh, uh, 
with determined determination, we can develop the sense anywhere, regardless of what we're doing. Having said that, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross both, both um, are very attentive to the needs of those beginning the journey to God in prayer, which is why they both, they both freely emphasize the need for, for guided, patient meditation. Teresa understood herself uh, from her own experience what we, in our day, can't help but acknowledge, which is that uh, our, our minds are like what she says, a pack of wild horses. Um, and so we, though we may feel a desire for more silence and prayer um, and simplicity in prayer, um, it may not be the most prudent thing for, for any of us to just jump right in. Um, I can sp- speak from my own experience before I entered Carmel that there was a there can be a lot of frustration if, if one tries to do that. Um, and so it is, it is important to be content with, uh, with a book, uh, with a, a spiritual book, for, with the scriptures, um, which, is, which the Carmelite saints reverence above all, um, or to make use of, of certain devotions, like the Rosary or Divine Mercy Chaplet, anything that helps us to focus on our Lord and to, and to as Teresa says, to stir up love. This is uh, each each one of us progresses at our own pace, um, and uh, and so it is important to just be patient, um, to have this patient, st- uh, steady determination, um, and in time we'll be brought to uh, what John of the Cross calls the prayer of loving attentiveness. So, how can we look at look at this in practice? Um, one might simply start by by finding a place of quiet, uh, of exterior of, uh, of quiet, yeah, uh, with, with very little noise, but perhaps uh, most beneficially with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And, and then after setting ourselves into a, a relatively comfortable position where uh, our body is able to simply be present with our heart and mind to God, we can begin our prayer with uh, a passage from Scripture or from a spiritual author. I myself uh, and personally find passages such as uh, Matthew's Beatitudes or, or John chapter 15 or Isaiah 53, the song of the suffering servant, uh, speak most profoundly to me of, uh, of who it is that I'm there to be with. Um, and so a slow reading of these words, uh, whatever they be, whatever you, whatever you use, um, per- particularly from scripture, from the Gospels, um, listening to what they say and and who is speaking them um, will help us gently become aware that Jesus is here and and really here, um, very uh, very explicitly here, although we we may not be able to to sense him. Um, Through faith, we can rejoice in knowing that we have this, this greatest companion one could ask for, namely Jesus himself. And during this time, um, it is good to remember that uh, if, our, if it's our first time coming to, to this simple meditation or if we just come, for, come in from a very busy time of day, um, our minds can naturally tend to drift to distracting or preoccupying thoughts. Um, and so this is the time to simply recall Jesus, recall our presence, recall ourselves back into Jesus' presence. Um, and simply look at him. Simply remember that he is here, right next to us, right with us, very within us. Um, and to speak to him, to speak to him with vulnerability and, and openness about maybe what is bothering us, or or to praise him and thank him for for something great that happened that day. Um, and this this recurring pattern of distraction um, and return, you know, this uh, other reciprocal movement. It, can oftentimes seem to be one's dominating experience of prayer. Um, we find that we can never set our thoughts straight. Uh, as we said, Teresa uh, describes the mind as, as this pack of wild horses just going from one place to another. And so it is good to simply uh, and gently direct our thoughts to him, uh, all of our thoughts back to Christ. Um, Teresa speaks uh, of, our, of our minds as though uh, very, very beautifully of our uh, very beautiful counsel of our minds as a vacuum, 
our thoughts simply as a vacuum if we if we make this strenuous attempt to empty our thoughts it is not to, it is not the way she says that that prayer works um, um, we uh, we are, immediately something will will come and fill our mind with that thought that we push away um, and so it is important simply just to to be present and to and to redirect ourselves gently back to him um, and in then in that point uh, after faithfulness to in that uh, the Lord will give us his peace. So, I guess to wrap up what we began with, um, Our Lady at the Annunciation is, is this a perfect example of this reciprocal movement toward which we are all called to strive um, in our prayer life. In the angel's greeting, we can see God's own drawing of us to be more, le- more deeply aware of his presence in our lives. And, uh, and to to recognize the inestimable grace that he has given us in our baptism. Um, any growth in the spiritual life is uh, a deeper flourishing of that same grace, and uh, and it is good to important it is good to remember that uh, that this awakening, this recognition of God's God's uh, very deep presence, constant presence to us, can happen to us to each one of us in as many ways as there are unique persons in the world. Um, this can, t- can hop- often happen to us, uh, uh, appear to us as, as this unknown or strange or unsettling experience, um, perhaps sometimes even out of experience of suffering. Um, but uh, we can see this same reaction in Our Lady, um, in her greeting, you know, uh, even as, as perfect as we know her to have to be, um, the scripture says, and she was deeply troubled at, so, at what sort of greeting this might be. Um, like Mary, we uh, we are called to allow God to accomplish these great things in us. Um, if only we accept to offer what it is that he asks of us, and to recognize that the first gift, as we said earlier, always lies with him, not us. We are, we are creatures. We are, uh, we are his children, you know, we, we uh, have been redeemed by him, but we, it is God who has created us, God who has redeemed us. Um, and we are called in, in faith to respond to him. Um, and this engagement, this, this relationship that we're speaking of, this, uh, this uh, back and forth reciprocal movement is, requires on our part discernment, um, meditation, Cooperation with reason, and and another uh, last uh, essential point of of Carmelite spirituality is self knowledge, um, much in the same way that Mary asks the angel uh, how this conception of Christ will occur. She reflects on her own her own life experience, um, um, and yet this this offers the angel an opportunity. This offers God an angel, the, God the opportunity to promise seemingly impossible things to her. And to us, he makes these same promises. Um, but in the midst of these promises that, that, that are made to us, um, in the grace that has been given to us, and the awakening that we can experience of, of God's calling for a deeper relationship with him, uh, we can respond in faith with a bold and daring yes to the great plans that he has for us, uh, whatever that may, may mean for us in the future. Our Lady certainly had no explicit idea of, of to what end God was leading her, uh, namely beneath Jesus on the cross. But, but she trusted in the goodness and faithfulness of God, who was uniquely guiding her. In this way, all of us can bear witness to Jesus. And uh, with great faith to, that, uh, to the great plan that the Father is enacting at this very moment in and through us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.